to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ in acts chapter 2 verse number 37 the greatest question ever asked comes Men and brethren, what shall we do? And friend, that's the question that we're going to be considering in this series of lessons on cases of conversion in the book of Acts. We're so glad that you've joined us and we welcome you to our study today. As always, today's lessons are being brought to you by members and congregations of the Church of Christ. The Church of Christ in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. You'll find people there who love God, who are concerned about souls, and who want men and women to go to heaven. Friend, if you've got a Bible question, they'd be happy to sit down and study the Word of God with you. Maybe you'd like to learn more about salvation or the church or, or how to worship God correctly. You'll find folks at the Church of Christ who'd love to sit down and study the Word of God with you. Friend, we'd also like to help you in your study of God's Word here at the Gospel of Christ. This evangelistic work of the Church of Christ has as its main aim to help people know God better and ultimately to go to heaven. Won't you visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com? From there, you can find all our video and audio lessons as well as transcripts online. We've got a wide variety of good Bible study material that will help you grow in your faith. And so if you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson or any of our lessons, again, you can visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From there, you can fill out a media request form. We'd be glad to send that to you on DVD or CD free of charge, or you can get a free digital download as well. And if you've got a question about anything that we say, friend, we're happy to discuss that with you. Please email us or call us at the information given, and we'll be happy to discuss the Word of God with you. And friend, we're just so glad again that you've joined us. I want to encourage you, if you don't have it with you, to locate your Bible and have it handy as we're going to let the Word of God discuss, let the Word of God be our main authority in all that we say and do. And so let's begin by thinking about uh, the book of Acts in particular. Let's give a little introduction to where Acts stands in the New Testament so we can better understand this series of lessons. In the New Testament, there are four unique categories to it. The first category is Matthew through John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John we would refer to as the gospel accounts. These tell us about who Jesus is about the life of Christ, about the life that He lived, His death, His burial, His resurrection, and, and how much He did for mankind in bringing salvation. Then we come to the book of Acts. It's the second category in the New Testament. Now that we've learned about who Jesus is, we now learn how to become a Christian. The book of Acts is all about what must I do to be saved? It's the book of conversions in the New Testament. And so that's what we're thinking about today. The third category would be Romans through Jew. Now that you are a Christian, now that you've learned how to become a Christian, here's how you live your daily life as a Christian. And so it's about Christian living in the practical setting, then that fourth stanza, the book of Revelation, tells us how to die victoriously in Jesus Christ, be faithful unto death. And so let's begin as we think on this first lesson. Today we're going to be talking about Acts chapter 2, the conversion of the 3,000 on Pentecost. But as we do that, let's think for just a moment about the need for conversion. Friend, I want to ask you to consider with me why there is such a serious need for conversion today. Why do men and women need to be converted to Christ and His cause? And friend, the answer is very clear when we open a scripture. First of all, 
We need to be converted and obey the gospel because man cannot save himself. Uh, Jeremiah 10, 23. In the long ago, Jeremiah said, O Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It's not in man who walks to direct his own steps. We can't save ourselves. We can't figure out our own path. We can't get to heaven on our own. Proverbs 16 verse 25 says, There's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. And so the realization today that we can't save ourselves helps us realize we need conversion. Man also does need saving. Friend, we need conversion. We need to obey the gospel because man needs to be saved. Now initially you might ask, saved from what? And friend, that's a wonderful question. For in Romans 3 verse 23 we learn, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 6, 23 says, The wages of sin is death. All have sinned and the wages of that sin is death. In the long ago, Isaiah said in Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2, that the Lord's ear is not heavy that He cannot hear, His arms not shortened that He cannot save, but our sins and our iniquities separate us from our God. And thus the soul who sins will surely die. We need to be converted and obey the gospel because sin separates all of an accountable age from God. Friend, we need conversion because only God's plan can save. Do you remember the words of Jesus in John 14 verse 6? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. He's the only way we can be saved. Thus, it's His plan that saves man. Hebrews 7 verse 25 and 26 says, Jesus is able to save to the uttermost or completely those who come to God through Him. Paul said in Romans 1 16, the gospel is God's power unto save. And as Jesus, as Mary and Joseph are being told that Jesus is going to come into the world, they're told this, You'll call his name Jesus, which is translated Emmanuel, God with us, and he'll save his people from their sins. And so this series of lessons that we're going to be looking at over the next few weeks specifically looks at the New Testament accounts of salvation in the book of Acts. We're going to look at what did people do in the book of Acts to be saved as a pattern for what men and women today can do to be saved. And so let's begin by realizing this. To be saved, those on the day of Pentecost had to hear the Word of God to be saved. Look in your Bible in Acts chapter 2, and I want to direct your attention to verse number 14. What did they have to do to be saved? Well, they had to hear the gospel. Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. And then he's going to go on and preach Jesus as the way of salvation. But what's, what's interesting is without hearing the word of God, these people could not be saved. He stood up with the eleven and he proclaimed Jesus as the way. And friend, the Bible teaches if men and women are going to be saved, they've got to hear the gospel. Romans 10, 17 says this, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Now friend, I understand as I read my Bible that faith is essential to salvation, right? Hebrews 11, verse 6, Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Well, if faith is essential to salvation, whatever way I get faith, is also essential, right? Listen again to Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Friend, if a person is going to be saved, just like on the day of Pentecost, they had to hear the Word of God to be saved, men and women today must listen 
to what the Bible says. Now, this is such an integral part of salvation that I think if we're not careful, sometimes we rush right through this idea without really thinking about it. What does it really mean to hear the Word of God? Friend, I want to suggest that it means several things this morning or today. Hearing the Word of God means these things. First, when we hear the Word of God, we've got to recognize its authority. Uh, let me give you a few examples. Mark chapter 9, verse 7. Jesus is on the Mount of Transfiguration. He's take Peter, taken Peter, James, and John up on that high mountain. He's transfigured before them. His clothes began to shine. Moses and Elijah appear, and Jesus is talking with them. And the disciples are afraid, the text tells us. They don't know what to say. So they, Peter blurts out, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let's make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And one of the accounts tells us, before he even gets those words out of his mouth, a voice from heaven came saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Friend, to hear the word of God means we must respect the authority of God and His Son. You see, Jesus has all authority. Matthew 28, verse 18. Jesus is the head of the church. Ephesians 1, verse 22 and 23. And it is the words of Jesus that are going to be our judge on the final day. John chapter 12, verse 48. My friend, hearing the Word of God doesn't just mean that we recognize its authority. It also means that we're willing to search and to seek and to prove what we're being told is true according to the Word of God. Uh, listen to Acts 17, 11. Here is a perfect example of what it means to hear the Word of God correctly. Acts 17, verse 11, the Bible says, These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. I want you to stop for just a minute and think about what's going on here. The Apostle Paul comes to the region of Berea. He knocks on the door. They open that door. Paul says, I've got a message from Jesus. They say, Paul, we've heard about you. We don't know about all this, but we want to hear about Jesus. So they say, come on in. Paul sits down. They sit down. He begins from the scriptures to tell them about Jesus Christ. They begin to write it down. They begin to think about it. They begin to take notes. And do they automatically accept what Paul said, hook, line, and sinker? No, they say this. They say, Paul, we appreciate you coming by today. We've heard what you had to say. We've taken notes. Now we're going to search the Scripture and see if that's true. We're going to check what you've said by the Word of God. And friend, that's what it means to hear the Word of God correctly. Please understand me well. This hearing the Word of God does not mean that anytime somebody claims to say something from the Bible, you automatically accept that. No. Hearing the Word of God correctly means we're going to listen intently and then we're going to let the Word of God be the final authority and we're going to check it by the book. And you see, as Peter goes on, in Acts chapter 2, he's going to preach Jesus from the Scriptures to them. He's going to show that in verses 16 through 21 that the Scriptures prove Jesus is the Son of God and that God proves that with miracles. Verse 22, God <clears throat> proves that His Son Jesus is the Messiah by the signs and the miracles and the wonders that are done. Uh, think about the miracles of Jesus feeding the 5,000. Think about the wonders of Christ, walking on the water. Uh, think about the signs that Jesus did, the, the man of transfiguration, the, 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 the Spirit of God descending upon him at his baptism. Peter preaches and boldly proclaims Jesus is the Son of God. Then he proclaims that Jesus and his plan of redemption is the only way to be saved. Verse number 23. He proves from the scriptures that the resurrection of Jesus proves He is the Son of God. Verses 24 through 28. He'll even go back and show from the Old Testament this idea. And then He raises up 
one of the greatest heroes in the Old Testament, David, to prove Jesus is the Christ. Look at verses 29 through 35 with me. Peter says this, Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David. He is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. David, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. That this Jesus God raised up, of which were all witnesses, therefore being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out that which you now see and hear. Listen to this. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Here David is talking about Christ, and he says, The Lord, my Lord, said to me, the Lord, the, the, the ruler of that time, sit at your, I'll make your enemies sit at your footstool. And so here he shows that Jesus indeed is the Son of God. And then it all comes to a climax. Acts chapter 2, verse number 36, the pivotal verse of this sermon and probably the key verse of the whole Bible. Everything before Acts 2.36 is looking forward to it. Everything after it is predicated upon it. Notice what Peter says and based on the fact that David calls Christ Lord and that he's the one who's above all. Listen to what Peter says in Acts 2 verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Friend, the crux of the matter today is, Jesus is my Lord. He's the Christ. He's the Messiah. Now, let's take just a moment and let's think about what that verse is talking about. God has made this Jesus who they crucified and who was crucified for our sins, 1 Peter 2, verse 24, Lord and Christ. What do the words Lord and Christ mean? The word Lord means master or owner. He's the one who is over all. He's the master of my life. He's the one whom I must submit to. And then secondly, he is the Christ. The word Christ means the Messiah, the anointed one. The prophets preached about it. The scriptures proclaimed it. it, it the fulfillment of everything God put in motion is fulfilled with the Messiah, Jesus, coming into this world. My friend, there's another very powerful point that we need to notice in Acts 2 verse 36, and it's this. I want you to see the personal nature of sin. God's made this Jesus whom you crucified, Lord in Christ. Well, you say, well, I, I, I'm not the one who was there in the first century. I'm not the one who shouted out to Pilate or to Herod, crucify him, crucify him. A friend, I may as well have been because it was my sins that put the Lord on the cross. Listen to 1 Peter 2.24. The Bible says, He Himself bore our sins in His own body upon the tree, that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed. Friend, Christ died for my sins and for yours, and each of us needs to realize the personal nature of what Christ did for me and you. And based on that, we need to respond properly to this great truth. Look again in Acts 2 verse 37. The Bible says, When they heard this, they were cut to the heart, and they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Friend, these people had the right response. They were cut to the heart. But they recognized, they realized this truth was something that Peter proclaimed as from God. They believed the message. And friend, if people are going to be saved today, they've got to believe that message as well. 
There's no believing. There's no salvation without believing. John 8, verse 24, Jesus said, Unless you believe that I am He, you'll surely die in your sins. Please understand today, a person cannot be saved without believing Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by Him, John 14, 6. But you know, they also had another response here, and that is they had the right type of sorrow that led to repentance. They were cut to the heart. One translation says a dagger was run through their heart. What's that talking about? They felt emotionally, psychologically, intellectually, they felt sorrow for what they had done. They got the point and they realized, wow, we just killed our own Savior and they responded with great sorrow and a desire to do God's will. Friend, if somebody's going to be saved today, they've got to recognize that truth and respond with a good heart as well. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10 says, Godly sorrow produces repentance. Sorrow alone is not repentance, but it does produce repentance. And so do we have that sorrow then when we realize Christ died for my sins? And now upon the heels of that great question, Men and brethren, what shall we do? We realized we've killed our own Messiah. We realize we're lost in sin. What do we need to do to be saved? Peter tells them poignantly what to do. Look in Acts chapter 2 with me in verse number 38. Peter responds by saying, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Peter tells them clearly they've got to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Now, friend, let's realize that re just like belief, repentance is essential to salvation. If a person's going to be saved, he must repent. Jesus taught this so clearly. In Luke chapter 13, verse number 3 and verse number 5, Jesus said, Unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Peter preached just a chapter later in Acts 3 verse 19 that repentance leads to salvation. And then, of course, we learn that repentance isn't just tears alone. Repentance, what is repentance? It's a changed will that leads to a changed way. Or to put it more succinctly, Repentance is a change way of thinking that leads to a change way of acting. Luke chapter 3 verse 8 helps us understand that. Certain people came out to be baptized by John and John realized they were just doing it because everybody else was. And so John said, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. And then he said this, bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. Repentance is not just being sorry. Repentance is not just accepting that my way of thinking is not God's way of thinking and it needs to be. Repentance is a changed way of life. I'm not saying, we're not saying a person's going to be perfect and that we'll never sin, sin again, but when we change our way of thinking, we also do our best every day to change our way of acting and to be what God wants us to be. Now, friend, no doubt. As we realize in other accounts, uh, to be saved, one must also confess Jesus as the Son of God. Romans 10 verse 10, with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. When they heard the message that Jesus indeed was the Christ, they're ready to do something. They acknowledge Him as their Savior. But friend, please don't miss this. The message of salvation did not stop at repentance and confession. Peter said, you need to repent, listen to this now, and be baptized, why Peter? For the remission of sins. Friend, let's realize today that the Bible clearly teaches baptism is for salvation. That is, it's something to do, we do, that God told us to do by which 
One contacts the blood of Jesus and is saved. Uh, listen to the words of Jesus. You talk about a clear passage. Notice this one with me. Mark 16, verse 16. Jesus said this, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Now, friend, did Jesus say you must believe and be baptized to be saved? Yeah, he went on to say, he that does not believe shall be condemned. If you don't believe, you're not even a candidate to be baptized. But if you believe and you're baptized, then Jesus said, you'll be saved. Listen to 1 Peter 3 verse 21. Peter said, baptism does now also save us. Why? Because at the point of baptism is when we contact the death of Jesus. Romans 6, verses 3 and 4. Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? Therefore, we are buried with Him in baptism into His death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Friend, the idea that, that baptism is not essential you don't find that in the Bible. That's false teaching, and that's not true. Let me, let me give you another example. Acts chapter 9. Saul is confronted on the road to Damascus by the Lord. He realizes Jesus is the Lord. Acts 9 verse 6, he cries out, Lord, what would you have me to do? Paul now recounts what he did in Acts twenty two sixteen. 16. Ananias comes to him, and it says, Saul, Saul, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized, listen to this, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. As we said, baptism is where we contact the blood of Jesus that saves. And thus, baptism is essential to salvation. And then we learn in Acts 2, verse 47, those who gladly received His word, verse 43, were baptized, and the Lord added them to the church. And so, friend, here's what we ask you today. We've seen one case of conversion in the Bible. We saw what they did to be saved. Have you done what they did? Are you sure you're saved if you have not done what they did? Friend, we encourage you today to obey the gospel, become a Christian. Join us next time as we're going to study another case of conversion in the New Testament. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, streaming, free media, and Internet. Our motto is truly to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. This is the Gospel of Christ. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844-6-GOSPEL. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the